Rios introduce our next speaker. Okay, uh, thanks Alex. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining. We have 100 people uh, online, so that's quite nice to see. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Pierre Le Baudy. Um, Pierre is uh, currently lecturer at the Faculty of uh, Information Technology at Monash University in uh, Melbourne, Australia. Uh, he was previously uh, a postdoc uh, in industrial engineering at Georgia Tech, and that's where uh, we met and uh, collaborated for a while. Uh, and before that, he obtained his PhD in uh, computer science from uh, Université Paris 11. Uh, and his, Pierre's interests have been in um, discrete optimization and computational complexity. In particular, in the last few years, he's worked a lot on a theory for branching uh, and integer programming, uh, and also tree size estimation. And so Pierre's going to uh, give us uh, the latest development uh, on that uh, today. Go ahead, Pierre. Hey everyone, uh, can you hear me? I think you have to un unshare the screen. And no, I, also can, I can kick him out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, let me know if there's any issue with you know sharing audio and and all of that. Um, yeah. Thanks uh, to both of you, Alex and Elias, for the invitation. Uh, I'm really excited to have a hundred-person audience uh, to talk to. And so today's talk is about tree size estimation. And, and before I start, I'd like to thank my amazing co-authors. It's been a great pleasure working with them. So uh, Gregor Handel, Daniel Anderson, and Mark Fetch, uh, if you have the opportunity, uh, try and collaborate with them. It's really a lot of, of fun and, uh, and they're really good and interesting people. Uh, so um, let's start with the, the question that some of you may have, which is, uh, how many tree size estimation talks can you possibly give? Uh, so I've been working on this for about four years. And at first we were just trying to estimate the tree size offline given trees that were already saved in a file. And then we started having a first skip implementation which estimated the tree size online but was a bit clumsy and memory intensive. And, and then we had uh, a better tree size estimation. And then for this triple AI conference, uh, we had our first um, use of tree size estimation to uh, speed up MIP solvers. And so um, on this timeline, uh, I would like to place uh, CPLEX 12.10, the release, uh, for reasons you will see later. And, uh, and so we are currently here, and this is the logo I made up for this seminar series because they don't have one yet, but I heard that they're working on it. And maybe if you have suggestions, you can send them to the uh, organizers. And so, uh, right, let's uh, get down to business. So um, what I wanna talk about is, is tree size estimation and completion approximation. And so this is the output of Skip7. Skip7 was just released less than a month ago. And so for those who don't know, Skip7 is an, an academic solver and uh, the source is completely open. And uh, this is probably one of the best tools you can work with if you're working on uh, MIP algorithms. And the novelty here that I wanna point out is this new column. So you're, if you're used to skip or maybe other MIP solvers, uh, the rightmost column is often the gap. And here this new column is to the right of the gap. So you still have the gap column, traditional gap. And now this column is the completion gap. And what it is, is essentially um, a progress bar that goes from 0% to 100% uh, monotonically. And, uh, and so here, this is an example on the instance Q, which is a, a rather simple instance. And uh, what happens here is that as soon as you start branching and as soon as you start having nodes, uh, sorry, as soon as you start having leaves, uh, we can make some prediction of how much of the search has been completed so far. And uh, so, you know, it doesn't move too much at first, but um, it progresses. And when you get to the very bottom, uh, so at 2000 nodes, we predict that this is 91% complete. And if you look at the log, the search terminates after 2085. And so uh, this is quite accurate. And if you compare this to what the gap is telling you, the gap says there is still 87% um, of gap to close. And for some instances, this may be nothing. And for other instances, you know, you may never be able to close 0.5% of the gap. So um, the gap is really, and I think it was originally intended as just 
uh, the measure of the quality of the current solution you have if you were to stop the search now. But because there was no other progress measure for MIP solvers, this became the de facto progress measure. But in fact, we will see it is a very bad progress measure. So here's another example. And so this is a version of a Steiner tree problem, which is infeasible. And uh, in this one, um, so we have a completion, which is also quite good. But what I wanted to point out is that we can give you a completion rate, even if the instance doesn't have a gap. So there's no primal bound, so the gap is infinite. Doesn't matter. Our methods can work, even if you have no dual bounds. In fact, some of the methods can work uh, for setups which are not just MIP, which is, can just be any type of tree search. Um, yeah, and here again, we get quite a good uh, precision. So I have to say that not all instances behave that well, and uh, this is work in progress, but I think we have reached a point that is good enough that we're confident releasing it as part of Skip7. So what I wanted to talk about now is um, how hard is it to actually do this? Uh, so as I've said, some instances don't behave too well, and how bad can it get? So we have some theoretical results for that. And how do we get to these results? Um, so we start by designing a branch and bound algorithm for vertex packing instances. And vertex packing or independent set, whatever you want to call it. And it doesn't really matter if you remember what this problem is. Uh, if you know, the paper is online, you can have a look. You don't need to know more about vertex packing for now. So uh, what we... Um, change in this branch and bound algorithm is that we branch in a specific way. And instead of taking a binary variable and saying you're either zero or one, we take uh, two binary variables of an edge uh, such that those two binary variables are fractional in the current LP. And we say, okay, either you're zero or you're zero. So we just have this small change uh, in the branch and bound algorithm, which is maybe not the typical branching strategy but it is a completely valid branching strategy. And so aside from this change, the rest of the branch and bound algorithm is quite typical, except that we're only looking at vertex packing for now. And so by making this change, what we can ensure is that every time we branch, the dual bound improves by 0.5, which is crucial for the proof. And now, uh, well, by having this, we can ensure that at every level of the tree, every node has the same dual bound. And because we're saying, you know, for the purpose of this algorithm, there are no primal heuristics. The only way you can find solutions, uh, feasible primal solutions, uh, is by LP. And so once you find uh, a feasible solution at the leaves, then uh, you just finish the level you're at and you're done. So all the optimal solutions are found by the LP at the leaves by, as a property of uh, the algorithm. And so at termination, all the leaves have the same depth. And so these results use Nemhausen, Trotter, and Picard and Keran results from the 70s. Um, and so uh, all of these are already uh, on optimization online, and I can give you the link later uh, if you need. And so the interesting property now of this branch bound tree, when it is complete, is that the only possible tree sizes are at 2 to the k minus 1 for some positive integer k. And so you can have, you know, 1, 3, 7, 15, and so on. So now, if I compute the LP root value, which I can do in polynomial time for vertex packing, and if I know the tree size, then by the property of the branch and bound algorithm, I can deduce the optimal value. And for vertex packing, if I have the optimal value, I can retrieve in polynomial time the optimal solution. So that means if I know the tree size, I can, in polynomial time, find an optimal solution. And so now suppose that there exists an oracle which can estimate the tree size within a factor half and two. So for example, let's say that the oracle predicts tree size 20. So that means I have the guarantee that the tree size is actually between 10 and 40. Okay, And because I have this property that the tree sizes can only be 2 to the k minus 1. I know that it can only be 15 or 31. 
And um, I know that because the dual bound increase, uh, increases by point, uh, I don't remember if it increases or decreases, so I'm just gonna say point 0.5, uh, improves by point 0.5. Um, because it improves by point 0.5, it cannot be either 15 or 31. It has to be one or the other. And I know which one it is by computing the root LP. So I can discard one of those two. And I know that the other one is the one that is correct. So with this Oracle, within a factor half and two, I can deduce the optimal, uh, the, the exact tree size and I can find an optimal solution. And so that leads us to the following theorem that if there existed a polynomial time tree size oracle within factor half and two for branch and bound, then vertex packing would be polynomial time solvable, which means that P would be equal to NP. So that means uh, even though I have not exactly formalized uh, this as a decision problem, I can write the statement that if there existed such an oracle, then P would be equal to NP, which means that uh, estimating tree size is hard within Factor two. Um, any questions so far? I'm going to pause for 10 seconds to give a, a chance. So I, yeah, I, I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, so the tree size Oracle is supposed to act with what information? Uh, well, it's, it's given it, the it's instance, given, the, it's the, given the inputs, it knows the branch and bound algorithm and it can do polynomially many operations. Okay. So it, it, it is allowed, for instance, so right now this only sounds like a statement on offline oracles, mm -hmm. right? Oracles that do not um, try to compute the tree size estimation online, mm -hmm. but really this oracle is allowed to solve polynomially many nodes of this branch and bound tree. Mm -hmm. so it also says something about online oracles, as long as they only solve polynomially many leaves, uh, polynomially many nodes of the branch and boundary. So this statement says, if you were to actually try to solve this vertex packing instance with this branch and bound algorithm, you would need polynomially, well, super polynomially many nodes before you could have uh, a guarantee of uh, such an approximation uh, with factor half and two, which is also <laughs> interesting because yeah. We, we wanted a statement on online algorithms, which is what uh, we have implemented. And here, and here polynomial time is, is with respect to the size of the, the, the instance? Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Other questions? Okay. Um, so let's continue. So what can we do in practice? So. What we're showing here is an example for the instance Dano int. And what we can do in practice is uh, we can have different measures within um, the, the branch and bound algorithms that track the progress of the search. So obviously we have the gap, the classical gap, but here, so sorry, let me mention what the X axis here it is here. So the X axis is the number of leads. Um, because at every leaf, we um, get a new observation of these measures. And so here, uh, the gap is transformed uh, from zero to one. So the gap is monotone between zero and one here. And uh, so you have to look on the Y uh, left axis. And so uh, another measure is the leaf frequency. So this is the only new measure in the new paper on optimization online. And so the leaf frequency is exactly what it says it is. Uh, it computes the ratio of number of leaves found so far to number of nodes found so far. And we know that at the beginning of the search, this is equal to zero. And at the end of the search, this is almost exactly half. And so uh, we know that it goes from zero to half across the entire search. It doesn't do this exactly uh, in a monotone way. Uh, but here on, in this particular instance, it looks quite monotone, but we don't have this guarantee in general. Um, the third measure that we can uh, have and that probably many of you have looked at uh, in the logs of solvers is the number of open nodes. And here, so in, in a red here, and you need to look at the, the Y axis on the right here, number of open nodes. We've probably all looked at this and thought, hey, this is pretty monotonic, oh, sorry, pretty unimodal. 
And so when it starts decreasing, we think, oh, finally, I'm, I'm you know, getting close to the end. But often you, you notice that you know, maybe a few lines of output later, it starts increasing again because, well, it looks um, unimodal here, but uh, in practice, there's a lot of oscillations. And so it's quite hard to predict when you've actually peaked and uh, started decreasing again. And so a fourth measure, measure is the SSGs for sum of subtree gaps. And so this is an extension of the gap. And so the gap only tells you something about the worst open node that you have in your branch and boundary. The SSG looks at all the open nodes and has, uh, so combines all the gaps at all the open nodes in a monotone way, such that every time you branch, you can only improve the SSG. So, uh, so the SSG starts at one and across the entire search goes to zero in a monotone way. And so this is, uh, work by Ozaltin et al. Uh, the reference is in the paper. It's not one of our things. And uh, finally, the tree weight. So uh, it goes from zero to one across the entire search, and it is also monotone. And so how do we compute the tree weight? The tree, uh, tree weight gives a weight to every leaf. And the weight of a leaf is determined by its depth, d, and, um, and you get it by just taking two to the minus d. So every time we find a leaf, we add two to the minus d to the cumulated tree weight. So when we start the search, we have no leaf, so we have a tree weight of zero. And then we get the first leaf at depth d, we get two to the minus d, total tree weight, and we add it up. And over time, we have the property that, uh, well, it, of course, it's monotone, and we converge to one as the tree uh, gets completed. And so, um, yeah, any questions on this? So I'm going to continue, but interrupt me if you have questions. Um, so these are just measures, right? This is what we can track as we solve. And as they are, they do not provide us with uh, prediction directly. Um, but um, what we can do is uh, we take those. So I probably should show you in the last uh, image. Here, on any of those, you can you know, do some sort of extrapolation and try to figure out where you're gonna hit that one. Let's say if you're the gap or if you're the tree weight, when am I gonna hit that one and how many leaves that corresponds to? And that gives you a tree size estimation. And you can do the same for, let's say the SSG. When am I gonna hit zero? And so with extrapolation techniques, uh, you can achieve a tree size estimation. And uh, so what we use for extrapolation is called uh, double exponential smoothing, which was the original technique used in the SSG paper. So we didn't make that up. Uh, and it's a, a very classical state-of-the-art time series forecasting technique. So uh, there's nothing fancy there, but it fits well for our, uh, tree size uh, measures. And so using double exponential smoothing, we can have this forecast. And so now taking the same X at every point, we take the data we have so far and we use um, time series forecasting to predict what we think the tree size is going to be. So now on the y-axis, we have the estimate of what the tree size is going to be for the same measures as before, right? And so open nodes uh, right, really stands out in red and because it has this big peak here, it's not doing too well. And the other ones behave pretty much the same, but tree weight seems to be doing better than SSG, than leaf frequency, than gap. And, um, so this also is a quite well behaved instance. Uh, it can be it can be worse. Okay, um, and so another technique that we have is we take those measures and we take the trend that is computed as part of double exponential smoothing and we use those as input features to a regression tree, and we can obtain something like this. Uh, so it's not really important what the details are, but it's just to give you an idea. And so here, uh, for instance, if we have SSG value uh, greater than 0.42, and if the open node trend is equal to zero and so on, then we predict that the completion, that we've completed 0.12 of the search or 12%. And, and so this regression tree only has eight possible outputs, but you can see that it spreads all over the zero one interval just because we're minimizing the squared error and you don't want to leave any big interval. Uh, but even though it only outputs eight different values, it is still quite good. But for user purposes, this would probably not be so great. But what you can do is also, as part of a random forest, 
have many of those trees and then the performance become good. So yeah, let's see. I'll, I'll interrupt with a quick question. This is uh, date based on data collected offline on a bunch of instances. Yes, absolutely. So we have a data collection process which allows us to not run the MIPS over every time we want to test something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of this happens offline and only at the end we test things online. Sure, yeah. So once you have the model, you're able to use it at every node and see what it thinks about the future. Yeah. When the training is offline. Yeah. Exactly. Thanks. Um, yeah, don't hesitate to interrupt. You just need to wave your hand and somebody will unmute you. So, uh, okay, let's look at the mean squared errors of those different uh, estimation techniques. And so what we're trying to estimate here is the percentage of the search completed. And so uh, for every line, let's take the first one, we have the absolute error. So remember this is absolute error for a value between zero and one. And then we have the relative error. And so for every technique, the gap, we have the training errors and the test error. And we also have three different stages of the search. We have a stage, let's say between zero and 30% at the beginning, then between 30% and 60%, and then 60 to one. And of course, as the search goes on, we have more and more data and there's less and less uncertainty about the search. Uh, and of course, you know, you could, you could cheat if I actually cut the search into the first 30% and I ask you, okay, we've done 30% of the search. How much do you think there is left? Uh, well, you could say 70%, uh, <laughs> but this is not exactly what we do. So this 0.3% is not exact. It is the tree weight. So we stop when we have accumulated a tree weight of 0.3, but we know that there's not a linear relationship between tree weight and number of nodes. Otherwise this would be a perfect estimate. So, uh, so you can't cheat by just saying there is 70% left. So we have those th three different stages and we have training uh, error and test error. So for now, just look at test error. And so we see that gap really stands out. So of course, bigger bars is more errors. So gap is really uh, doing not so well here. SSG, so sum up subtree gaps, which is a natural improvement over gap, uh, really does quite well. Tree weight, relatively similar to SSG. Leaf frequency is not so good. And the, now the linear model, I have not mentioned that so far. The linear model is a simple linear combination of the first four measures in this table. And linear monotone takes a linear combination of the monotone measures in uh, the top four. So the, remember the monotone measures here are, uh, well, gap is one, but it's bad. So we're not taking it. So we're taking SSG and tree weight. And so, uh, linear monotone does a little slightly worse than linear model, but it has the nice property that it gives a progress bar that doesn't go back. So this is the one that we use in skip and uh, regression tree does well, even though this is a uh, very limited depth and it can only output eight possible values. Uh, and then random forest with reasonably many trees does better than everything else. And then random forest big does slightly worse on test data, but you know, on training data, it looked quite good. So we, we have to be careful here because a lot of the time, you know, in the MIP community, people parameterize their algorithms on, on a test set and then, then the test on the test set. And if we had done that, then we would have thought, hey, random forest big is really doing well, but actually uh, it doesn't learn much more than a normal, you know, a reasonably sized random forest. So what's the takeaway here? The takeaway is that, uh, well, the best, single methods are SSG and tree weight. Uh, the linear model improves, but not much more than the linear model monotone, which is the one that is used to display things in skip. And then if you really want the best uh, prediction, then you use random forest, but random forest is not monotone. Okay, so what can we do with this? Well, you can display it for the user, but we can also do something that we call a clairvoyant algorithm. And what we say, uh, we say that the clairvoyant algorithm is an, an algorithm that uses the tree size estimation to adjust the, adjust the search strategy at runtime. And so it has a vision of the future and it can make changes based on how large the tree is going to be. And so, uh, yeah, it's a nice definition, but we also have uh, an algorithm that comes with it. And so we have defined clairvoyant restart and so we decide when to restart 
the tree search based on the number of estimated nodes that the tree is going to have. And so the bottom line, I mean, there's a whole paper about it. You can, you can have a look, but the bottom line is that up to a thousand nodes, we look at what's the tree size estimation. And if we have done less than 2% of the search so far, we restart. And uh, it sounds very simple and it is, uh, but you get a 2% speed, speed up on the skip internal test set and 10% on the hard instances. And this is, uh, this is the, the, you know, I don't give the, the tests uh, details, but this is very thorough. Uh, it, this is in the skip seven release report. Uh, and so this, this works surprisingly well. Uh, and, uh, and so now I'm going to make a bold claim and I'm going to say that, you know, this line of work offers a new way to do MIP solving and, and coming up with new algorithms to solve MIPs. And, uh, and so what's the old way? The old way is you have an idea, you implement it, you test, some instances get better, some don't. And now you have to figure out how to tune the solvers such that your idea only run on the instances that will benefit from it. And this is a big time sink and it's not guaranteed to work. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, it's so hard to get uh, numerical improvements lately for MIP solving because this is, this is very tedious. And, and so what is this new way that I'm suggesting? Well, I'm saying, um, you know, start solving as usual. You estimate the search progress online, the way that we're describing it here. And uh, you change the strategy for the search based on how the search is going, okay? And so if you're, let's say, working on primal heuristics at any given time in the search, you can do more, more primal heuristic uh, runs if you think that the dual bound's not moving well enough. Uh, but uh, you know, if you're working on pre-solvers, that doesn't really help you because if I tell you, oh, the tree size is large now, well, it's too late to do any more pre-solving. Well, it's too late unless you do a restart. And the good thing is that the restarts actually are for free. In, I mean, they actually, even if you don't do anything new, a restart will help you. So now you have the possibility to change the way you pre-solve, to change how and what you cut, and to change the way you branch and so on. So now you can change the search strategy at the root node and you can do this multiple times if it makes sense. Okay. And uh, so one could even say that this is, you know, uh, a dynamic search strategy. And the reason that I'm saying this is that uh, in CPLEX there's a thing called dynamic search and in CPLEX 12.10, which finally comes up in the stock, remember it came out at the end of 2019. Uh, actually, I should show you this, which is the CPLEX uh, website. And this is the change log of CPLEX 12.10 and other changes to the log. So that's just the output. Uh, they tell us this, display MIP restarts in dynamic search. And I'm gonna let you read this paragraph because it makes no sense for me to read it, but it's important. So I'm gonna let you read it for 30 seconds. Okay, so what's the takeaway here? The takeaway is that they are telling us that restarts are part of dynamic search. And they're clearly telling us that it's been like this all along. And that uh, it's been five to 10 years probably that the restarts have been part of dynamic search. And the reason that it's coming out now is as much as I'd like to, to it to be the case, it's not because of my research. I think it's because there's enough shuffling in the big commercial teams that now the cat is out of the bag and all the solvers do this. So uh, CPLEX, doesn't mind telling us this now. It's, they're not spilling any trade secrets anymore. And so they're telling us, well, this is partly what dynamic search is. And if you think, well, um, then if we do restarts, then, I mean, one restart is, is, not, is hardly dynamic, but if you now allow to change what you do after you restart based on the information you've collected, and the information doesn't just need to be the tree size. It could be other things that you did not know before solving the instance, but now you, now you know you know which other algorithms to run. Now you can do this dynamic search yourself. And this is all in skip. So now the burden of doing all of this is taken from you. And all you need to do is use your existing ideas and implement them dynamically. And, and, and uh, 
hopefully that should help. And I, I'm ready to bet that um, we can get a lot of uh, improvements in MIP solvers just by do, you using this, this dynamic uh, search idea. Uh, so, I mean, this, you know, this is a bold claim. And of course, I don't know exactly what dynamic search is, but CPLEC is starting to tell us. And I think that uh, we could really do much more clever and interesting things. And it may be easier to get improvements this way than, than a, lot of the, a lot of the other things that, that uh, people are trying and have tried in the last uh, you know, 20 years or something. So uh, I'm going to leave you with that thought, and I hope I get a lot of interesting uh, and, and exciting questions. Hey, thanks, Pierre. Uh, uh, so if you'd like to ask a question, we need to unmute you. So yeah, Andrea already has a question. Right with Andrea, yeah. Andrea, please go ahead. Okay, Alex, can you try unmuting Andrea? You can't seem to unmute him. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, so Pierre, nice work, very interesting. Uh, I was partially aware of this and partially not, so very good to know. I mean, I, I would like to just object a little bit on the last part. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I definitely believe that restarting it would be a fundamental uh, component, but I don't think it's going to make uh, our life easier, right? I mean, mm. in a certain sense, there are infinitely many options that you can restart with. So yes, I don't think yes. that it's going to be easier for uh, us mm -hmm. to get uh, ways of uh, doing around. But I mean, I, I, I get your point. Uh, so you're saying we have to be, more, we, 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 sh we should allow ourselves to be more flexible, which is okay. I agree with you. I'm not be sticking only with uh, one part, but when you were mentioning that uh, the game is always to try to find a way of uh, making your idea working in the MIP solver, it will still be difficult in my opinion, but that's just a comment. Thank you. Let me uh, look at the chat. Um, are there other questions? Yes, so I have one. Yeah. Uh, on the machine learning side, um, yeah. it seems that ideally you would like your, uh, your machine learning model uh, to, be, to behave uh, in a monotonic way with respect yeah. to some of the features. Sure. Um, but so linear monotone here is the one that only uses the monotone metrics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, have you thought about actually fitting a monotonic machine learning model? For example, you can do li isotonic linear regression and then you get a model which is consistent with what you think is the right bias. So uh, I think it makes sense. We haven't tried it. Uh, Happy to give it a, a try uh, if you're interested. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it makes it makes total sense, and it's just that you know we're we're not really machine learning people. We we're oh, well, yeah, but it's, like, uh, <laughs> it's just a one-liner in scikit-learn. If you know if you're fitting a model there, you just change from sure, linear sure. to linear isotonic, and it's sure, harder sure. to fit, but it, it might yeah. be a more useful model. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's the, the good thing with the random forest is that you can just ask a Python package to output a series of ifs in C, and then you can just include that in, sure. in skip. I don't know how easy it would be to go from a scikit-learn package in Python to uh, you know, pre-cooked model in C to skip to read. Uh, so that's, that's the, you know, it's a one-liner in Python, but then the problem is we, we, need, we need this in skip. So I don't know how easy it would yeah, be. Yeah, no, it, it's easy, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, any other question? Okay, there's a question from Mathieu. Uh, saying, uh, okay, there's a few questions. I'll go through them in order. Sure. Uh, Robert asked, can you also estimate progress towards reaching a certain gap limit? Example, 5%. I think this is similar to uh, uh, Fischetti, uh, uh, Martina, uh, Julia, and uh, Andrea's uh, work on, on predicting resolution, right? So, I mean, if, if you set your you know, relative gap from the get-go to be 5%, then um, you know, the tree weight works the same. A leaf becomes a leaf earlier and you can use the same technique. Now, mm -hmm. if you don't do this, you still want, you know, within a, a complete branch and bound search, if you still want the 5% estimate, I, I don't know uh, right off the top of my head how to get this. Maybe, maybe it's easy, maybe not. Okay. Uh, Mathieu is asking, uh, nodes that are pruned by cuts are counted as leaves, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, a question from Ali, 
uh, did you do strict feature extraction on each, each node? So you would be having more feature uh, in, in or more features in order to boost the results. Uh, I don't know what strict feature extraction means, but uh, so did you? I, I guess the question is: Did you? Did you? Is your data uh, consisting of features collected at every single node? Mm, well, the, the the features are collected at every leaf, right? Uh -huh. Because our leaves are our observations. Um, but the features are only, you know, what is the gap value, or what is the SSG, or what is the tree weight, the leaf frequency, mm -hmm. and the trend component in the double exponential smoothing uh, time series forecasting technique. Okay. And a, and a last question uh, from, uh, from Robert is, what's already done in solvers such as SKIP uh, to guess the right parameter settings at the beginning of the solve based on, on input data? Uh, I guess it really depends on, on which component you're looking at, but there's not much that's automated. Uh, you know, a lot of it is, is just every programmer, programmer for themselves uh, and they have to come up with their own techniques. Some, there's some novelty in terms of uh, rich primal heuristic to run. So now there's sort of a, you know, um, UTC uh, type of technique to decide which mm -hmm. primal heuristic to run, which is not exactly setting the parameters, but it, it replaces other parameters that would statically tell you which heuristic to run and how much of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, but a lot of it is, is static. But in the end, a lot of static parameters still look at the data and then you end up having a very dynamic uh, run, so to speak. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, if there aren't any, uh, and if you, if you have a bit of time, we'd like to uh, socialize with people over your own coffee uh, from, from the comfort of your home, uh, then please stick around and Alex is gonna take it from here. We're gonna do a small social experiment. Yes, and I'm gonna stop the recording now.